There have been a series of far-right victories across Europe, most recently in Austria. The country's far-right Freedom Party won an historic victory in that general election, securing 29% of the votes. Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, in Austria's general election, the Freedom Party won the largest share of the vote, beating the governing Conservatives. But it was not an outright majority, and rival parties are refusing to form a coalition with them. For the first time since the Second World War, Austria's far-right party, led by Herbert Kickel, has won the biggest slice of votes in the country's general election. Herbert Kickel! Oh, you These 29% election results are well invested. They are an excellent investment for the Freedom Party because one thing has happened today. We've actually opened this door. We've opened the door to a new era. We are now really going to write this new chapter in Austrian history together. Despite emerging as the leading political party, the far-right FPO still faces challenges in forming a coalition. Almost all the other parties say they won't work with them. As we can see in the US, in Hungary and in Slovakia, we know how quickly the far-right can rebuild our democracy and how they go about it by attacking the judiciary, independent media and much more. And we will not allow that. We know what the FPO stands for, how it has become even more radical, how they are really shaking these democratic pillars, but not only shaking them. The danger is there if they come into a government office. And it is not only Herbert Kickel, it is the entire FPO that endangers this democratic republic. It is not only other political parties that are concerned. People have taken to the streets to protest. Oh, that's a difficult question. It is definitely a shift to the right in Austria and throughout Europe, and that we are losing our free country and our free life. The Austrian election results follows far-right successes in Eastern Germany, the Netherlands and Marine Le Pen's party in France. Far-right parties have power in Italy, Slovakia, Croatia and Hungary. Herbert Kickel says his victory heralds a new era. The party is Eurosceptic and has strong anti-immigration views, vowing to build a fortress Austria to block migrants. It also blames the country's problematic neutrality on the war in Ukraine for rising inflation and increased cost of living. As political parties weigh their options, time will show if the country will embrace the far right's vision or will political unity against them prevail. Well, let's meet our guests in Virginia, in the United States. We have Farid Hafez. He is assistant teaching professor of international relations at William and Mary University and a senior fellow at Georgetown's University Bridge Initiative. In Washington, D.C., Ralph Schulhammer, head of the Center for Applied History and International Relations Theory. That's at the Matthias Corvinus Collegium in Budapest. And in Vienna, Maciej Kisilowski, Associate Professor of Law and Strategy at Central European University in Vienna. Guys, you're all very welcome to Roundtable. Farid, I'll come to you first. I notice a lot of support amongst young people in Austria for the Freedom Party. What was attracting the youth of Austria to that kind of politics? Um, well, I mean, first of all, I think uh, the Freedom Party of Austria, the far right, has made a, a huge success. It's a landslide victory. And I think one of the, the most interesting aspects in terms of making inroads was less so um, to win over the votes of the young, uh, rather not formally well-educated uh, white youth, was rather that they were able to attract a lot of the female voters. So this is a historic new phenomenon. Um, traditionally, the far-right FBO has always been strong, as I said, with young male voters. And it's really the first time that they were able to attract young female voters. Um, I don't have a full explanation for that yet, uh, but definitely one you can say, can say for sure 
and that's not a new phenomenon that has been ongoing for a decade uh, at least, is that the far right is just the best one in, in, in making use of social media. Uh, there is, without a doubt, uh, the far right is best in terms of using those technologies, um, investing a lot of money. Sebastian Kurz from the Austrian People's Party had always also been very successful in, in using that strategy, but the FPÖ is definitely first in that regard. Ralph, just come in on that point. Would you agree? Yeah, I think Vard made excellent points. Um, we did recently with a, a partner institute in Germany a little poll amongst uh, young people who voted for the AFD, and there's a surprising similarity in demographics. I think one reason why they do well on social media is because they also talk about issues that increasingly matter for young people. Uh, migration, of course, is one of the big issues here. Um, and we should not forget, right, uh, social media only kind of attaches itself to things that are already interesting for young people. It's not that somebody goes with a blank slate on TikTok and all of a sudden then gets pushed in one direction or the other one. Um, and I think this has been the recipe in the selections and Gen Z is moving to the right, whereas uh, the Green Party, if you will, or the left parties are becoming the boomer parties, for better or worse. I don't mean this in a derogatory sense at all. Mache, just come in on those points. What are your views on how successful the Freedom Party have been in terms of using social media, the content they've been putting out there in the run-up to the election, and the huge numbers of young Austrians who wanted to vote for them? Well, first of all, uh, we need to, we, we should be aware of creating alternative facts here. There is no landslide for FPO. There is no huge numbers. They won 28% of the vote which is plurality, uh, but it's not unlike um, the results of them or similar far-right parties uh, over the last 20 years in Austria. Actually, they won 1.4 million votes uh, this time, and in four out of five previous elections, they um, or similar parties like them won more than a million. Uh, so, uh, you know, we should be really, really worried with those labels such as landslide, um, because uh, sometimes they uh, uh, sound a little bit like a liberal self-flagellation uh, when we grant victory and legitimacy to parties that really didn't earn uh, that. Um, FPO is uh, a strong force in Austria. Austria has um, certain regions, certain parts of, of the country which are very conservative. And that showed, um, I think, of course, social media and effectiveness of the campaign played a role. But fundamentally, we have similar issues like in other countries where um, far right has a strong showing, which is inflation, economic concerns. And I would start here. Farid, let's talk about the leader of the Freedom Party then, Herbert Kickel. Um, what kind of a man is he uh, and what are his policies? I noticed that the outgoing chancellor, uh, Nehammer, said that he would never work with him, form a coalition with him, because it's impossible to work with someone who adores conspiracy theories. Well, I think it's an interesting figure because on the one hand, Herbert Kickel, the current chairman of the Freedom Party, um, is as, as old as the FPÖ is. I mean, he has been one of the writers of the of the um, public talks, uh, spin doctor of so many election campaigns of the Freedom Power Right since uh, the uh, the 1990s. And uh, <clears throat> in a way, he is the FPÖ um, more than probably any any other. Uh, a leader of the Fr Freedom Party uh, who is uh, at the forefront representing uh, um, um, th this new uh, this mov movement. So I think the interesting thing is obviously that for the conservatives to say we don't want to co coalize with Herbert Kickel, um, there are there are like two comments here. Like on the one hand, uh, we should not forget that Herbert Kickel has already been Minister of Interior in a coalition with the Austrian People's Party. And here is also, I think, the main reason for why they don't want to continue any coalition with him, because during that tenure as Minister of Interior, he basically raided the secret service um, of the, the, the domestic secret service of the Austrian state. So basically, um, his allegation was that he wants to uh, reveal the hidden secretive networks of the Austrian People's Party within the domestic uh, intelligence service. And I think this threat that the, the Austrian People's Party see here is that they cannot rely on somebody who is 
definitely open to questioning everything that they had established for the last couple of decades. Uh, this fear is really the reason that is driving somebody like Karl Nehammer to say, oh, don't, we don't want to coalize with Herbert Kickel. He also, <clears throat> uh, Chancellor Karl Nehammer from the Austrian People's Party, also clearly <clears throat> stated that he, like in, by implication, that he would be open to any sort of coalition with the Freedom Party if it is not under the leadership of Kickel. But since Kickel became first, it's hard and difficult to argue that, hey, you know, we don't give you the chancellor, but we're still going to go into a coalition with you. So I think what he's shooting for is uh, himself becoming chancellor and therefore forming a coalition with other parties like the Social Democrats or the Liberal Neos. Ralph, how disappointing will it be for Kickel? You know, a lot of success in the election, almost 29% vote share, if he doesn't end up Austrian chancellor? I don't think it will be a disappointment at all. I would just like to point out that since 1945, where the first election after World War II took place, it was either the Social Democrats or the Conservatives who came in first. So this is a change in the Austrian political landscape. I think to say, well, it's just 28 percent, it's not a big deal, is kind of missing the point here. We have now a, a, you know, a changing of the guards for the moment in Austrian politics. And if Herbert Kickel does not become chancellor, which he won't for several reasons, I think Farid pointed out a couple of very important ones, um, a, another form of government probably will not hold for an entire legislative period. So we will have new elections in two to three years, and then the FPÖ will not have 28%, they will have 34 35%. Uh, the future, if we look at the demographics and if there is not a significant change in the political circumstances, both in the area of migration and the economy, um, are very much in favor of the FPÖ. And I don't see that uh, a coalition between the socialists and the conservatives will be capable of addressing these underlying economic and cultural issues in a way that there will not be more voters moving uh, towards the FPÖ. So honestly, for Herbert Kickel, not getting into government now and sitting out one, one period until the next elections is probably the best thing that can happen to him. Maciej, your view on that? I mean, this is not going to be a flash in the pan result then. Well, this is purely speculative to say that, uh, you know, FPÖ is destined to gain support. Uh, as I said, uh, this uh, result is not out of the ordinary. Um, and it's magical thinking to, to be saying, oh, this is some game changer because they, um, they scored the plurality. Um, let's uh, remember that the, one of the reasons why they scored plurality is that over the last decade, a little le more than the decade, um, on the um, centrist liberal side, uh, there's been a fair amount of experimentation, new parties, especially the NEOS uh, Liberal Party, which simply, of course, splits the vote of the mainstream parties into, into more uh, factions. The same was uh, going on for the far right in the 2000s when Jörg Haider, the leader of FPO, split with FPO. Uh, and then, uh, of course, both of the far right uh, factions were scoring uh, way below the first place. So with the um, proportional uh, representation, we saw the same uh, ma magical thinking in case of uh, the Netherlands, in case of Poland, when the far right was saying, oh, we got first, so we should form the government, and then no nobody wanted to work with them. I think there is a lot of confusion because a lot of narratives about comparative politics is set uh, using the Anglo-American example, we have when we have the first past the post system, majoritarian systems, uh, where coming first really counts constitutionally. In proportional uh, systems, it's not; it's simply not the case. And uh, the fact is that Herbert Kickel presented himself as an alternative to the entire political establishment. And uh, more than 70% of the voters said, no, we do not want your alternative path. And I don't think that number will be drastically decreasing if the mainstream parties form a grand coalition. Farid, Kickel said he wants to build a fortress Austria. That must have been appealing to a lot of people. You know, he's clamping down on migration, big on security. Fortress Austria. How did that play out in the public narrative and discussion? I think to, you know, to give a little bit more of a context, I think we should not underestimate the uh, the impact that the far right FPÖ had uh, even beyond its own uh, political party. Uh, the far right FPÖ has shaped the 
public discourse in regards to issues like immigration, Islam, etc., tremendously. So if you if you raise the question of how much is the far right populism of a challenge, it's not only the FPÖ, it's also the conservatives. I mean, I think one one representative of the FPÖ said it very like very explicitly. He said, um, in terms of migration, in terms of uh, a lot of issues. Uh, like border control, etc. We are very much on the side of the FPÖ. Uh, it's just Herbert Kickl as a person that is uh, uh, creating so much of a trouble for us. So um, again, the context is that there is, un unfortunately, um, um, I say that as a person, as a political scientist of color who has lived in Austria for a very, very long time in, uh, of his life, far-right populism is the new normal. Um, and that extends beyond the FPÖ. Come in on that, Ralph. The new normal. How do you feel hearing that about Austrian politics? Well, it's, I think it's, again, for it is absolutely correct. But one of the reasons why it became the new normal is because there have been, I was just want to remind everybody who watches, the FBI have been talking especially about the migration topic since the early 1990s, once Ayur Qaeda took over the party. Uh, and they stuck to this topic. And the problem of migration or the, let's say, say the challenges, if you want to, if you want to use a less, uh, um, you know, radical uh, expression, none of them have been resolved. I mean, we know in the city of Vienna, and again, that's not hyperbolic. Those are simple facts on the ground. There are schools where 70% of children don't have German as a first language. This is mostly in working class districts. This means that people who are already in poorer districts, their children will get less of an education because teachers have to work as ages of integration because there's a language barrier to cross. This is not the fault of the children, right? If a Syrian child comes to Vienna, it's not the children's fault that it doesn't speak German, but this is still a problem that needs to be resolved. Um, it's a little bit, again, whistling past the graveyard, I believe, to say, well, you know, this is just a minor thing. As Farid correctly said, they are already framing the narrative. They're already framing the conversation. The only reason why the conservatives were strong under Sebastian Kurz was because they basically took took over the entire FPÖ program. So the influence of the Freedom Party goes beyond the 28% the they currently have. Um, and this is, by the way, a trend. Yes, they imploded under your Qaeda in the early 2000s. They had their issues with the Ibiza scandal. But if you look at this, the setbacks were temporary, but the trend was constant. And as I said, maybe this is going to change in the next couple of years. But if we look at the overall direction in Western Europe and partially also the United States, but for reading I am currently, I don't see it. I don't see a re-emergence of the social democrats or the liberals. I mean, look at Germany at the moment. I mean, basically liberal parties all over the West, with a few ex exceptions, are imploding. The social democratic parties all over the West, Germany, Austria, are imploding, with the exception of Denmark and Sweden, where they shifted to the right. I mean, just as a reminder for your viewers, in the early 2000s, the social democrats in Austria got almost 40% of the vote. In Germany, under Gerhard Schröder, they got 37% of the vote. And now they barely get to 20% in Austria, and I think they're currently in polls at 15% in Germany. And this was once in the 19th century, the largest political party in the world. So something is going on here. So to say, oh, this is just a one-off and there's nothing to see here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting approach, but, uh, but I think it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't really depict reality. Maciej, what did you think of the international reaction? A lot of shock and horror, the far right on the rise again in Austria, the AFD doing very well in Germany. You know, a lot of people looking back in history and thinking, what's happening in Austria right now, again? Yes, I think that the response, which is also visible um, uh, from what my colleagues are saying, is the most concerning because it, it, it has an air of self-fulfilling prophecy uh, when you... Uh, declare somebody a winner who is simply not a winner. Um, it is uh, absolutely true that uh, the situation, economic situation in Austria has been difficult. Um, and this is the, the reasons are well, well known. Russian aggression on Ukraine uh, created or added to the post-COVID supply chain problems, created massive inflation. Um, and uh, there is a lot of pain. Austrians are very used to stability. This is one of the m most uh, uh, expansive welfare states in the European Union. And there is a clear social contract in which those inherent right-wing tendencies, which 
I mentioned have been visible in electoral uh, results for decades um, uh, are, are kind of mitigated through a, a state that cares about everybody. And it is more and more difficult for a small open economy like Austria to manage this. That is true. Um, when it comes to migration, uh, my colleague said, uh, mentioned the uh, percentages of uh, foreign kids in public schools in Vienna. Well, my kids are foreign kids in a public school in Vienna. And uh, I can tell you only that in Vienna, where there is, of course, a very international, uh, multi-ethnic, multinational, multilingual society, the Socialist Party has strengthened its uh, lead, uh, won a commanding lead, and has been uh, governing the city uh, for 100 years, over 100 years, with an exception of the Nazi period. So we are talking about uh, the votes for the far right, actually in the districts and regions of Austria that even don't know my, much migration, except for a few seasonal workers who come for the skiing season. Mache, uh, so, I want to bring so Ralph we, in. We really Ralph is shaking his head. Ralph, you're shaking your head at Mache. No, because it's factually not true. You have to look at the results on the district level. Um, the, the SPÖ got 30%. They had a slight plus, but that came almost entirely from the Greens. So this was partially tactical voting by left-wing voters on the Green side. That's number one. Number two, the SPÖ got slightly over 30%. 20 years ago, they had almost 50% in Vienna. So that was significantly more. And I'm a little bit surprised. So if the FPÖ gets 30% on the national level, it's not a victory. If the SPÖ gets 30% in Vienna, it's a victory. And look at the large district. Look at Floridsdorf. Look at Favoriten. Look at Simmering, where, by the way, the FPÖ was only 200 votes away from getting the strongest party. No, you have to look at the district level. Because the argument I made was that it's particularly in working class areas where the FPÖ is winning. And this is precisely what you see happening on the district level. Ralph, so I want to bring Farid back in. Ralph, I sure. want to bring Farid back in. Farid, just call it for me. Does Kickel become Austrian Chancellor soon or does he wait his time and grow and come back even stronger in a few years' time? Well, um, I agree with Ralph that the most wisest decision he can make in such a difficult situation, economic-wise, is to actually stay out of power. <laughs> and I think also Nehama is, is is really going shooting for that uh, because that's the way how he will have more control over more offices. But I would like really to put something in, in context here of uh, something also Ralph said in terms of the migration issue. I think we have a larger problem in Austria. Austria is one of the most restrictive citizenship regime countries in the European Union. Now, if you look at, uh, 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 at the whole votes, 20% of the people stayed away from voting, which is their right, right? There is no obligation to vote. But another 20% of the whole population would be at an age where they could vote, but the citizenship regime is not allowing them to do so. So basically, when we speak about who elected, it's only 60% of the whole population that is at an age where they have uh, election rights that they voted for these political parties. And going circling back to what you said at the beginning, what is the, the, the phenomenon with the youngsters? Most of the youth in the cities, like, in urban spaces like the city of Vienna, for instance, are people of color. Now, many of these people don't have a voting right. So what we are seeing here is actually an increasing democratic void because the representation is not really reflecting anymore the population that is living in the country. And while at the very same time, the white dominant society tries to keep its privileges and defend it no matter what. And this is going to create a, a larger democratic problem for the future generations to come. Ralph, just on that point, a democratic void in the making. Well, I think we would completely have a new conversation here when we talk about, you know, who is right, who has the right to vote and who doesn't. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I would use the, the, the term people of color in, in Austria. If you look at the migration structure, the largest migrant groups are people from Germany. I don't think the Germans consider themselves people of color. Uh, Serbia is the second That's largest also group among them. Yeah, well, but they also cannot vote, so you would have to include them as well. So... I find the term well, people of color a little bit confusing in that context. I let's, think they are happy to vote on a district level, at least. <laughs> let's bring in Maciej yeah. again. Maciej, Maciej, I want your opinion on whether Kickel becomes chancellor soon, not at all, or just kind of kicks back and just waits. 
Well, I um, totally uh, think, and I made it clear in a recent piece for Project Syndicate, that uh, I think President van der Bellen should not give him the chancellorship because he didn't win uh, the mandate to be a chancellor. I am not as pessimistic um, uh, regarding to the consequences of uh, not giving him uh, the, the unearned mandate to govern. I think uh, the, the economic situation is going to improve not 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 fully because of the uh, you know fantastic governance of the austrian coalition uh, grand coalition which i think is now mo most likely but because simply um, uh, certain global factors that have been creating pain not only in austria but in other places will um, will will may will may uh, become a little better uh, uh, so so i don't think he should be a chancellor i don't think he will be a chancellor there will be a grand coalition and i uh, you know, mark my words, we can make a bet. He will not have 35% in the next, next election. We'll talk about that, no doubt, on a future roundtable. Mache, Ralph and Farid, thank you all so much for your insight on that a great conversation. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.